Let's get the seminar started, dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies. Welcome to the seminar, Finland and Norway as NATO allies. What can Finland learn from Norway? My name is Katja Kreutz, and I'm the program director of the Global Security and Governance Program at FIA. And I will act as your chair today during the seminar. This seminar embodies a joint collaboration project between NUPI, that is the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and FIA, uh, and the project is called New Allies, New Opportunities, Norway and Finland in a Changed Security Context. The project is led by NUPI and financed by the Norwegian Ministry of Defense, and it runs through 2023. And I'm sure Kristin Haugevik will, in her presentation, also say a few words about the project. So we have four distinguished speakers here today. First, Ambassador Begger Strömmen from the Royal Norwegian Embassy will provide his opening remarks to the seminar. His Excellency Strömmen took up the post as Norwegian Ambassador to Finland in September 2023, this year. Before Helsinki, Mr. Strömmen was ambassador to the United Kingdom and held the position of Secretary General in the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. He was also previously political director and ambassador to the United States of America. Second, we will hear from our two colleagues at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. First off, we have Kristin Haugevik, addressing the broader Norwegian foreign policy context, that is NATO-Norway's approach to global issues more broadly. Kristin Haugevik is a senior research fellow in the research group on global order and diplomacy at NUPI. Her research revolves around international diplomacy, interstate cooperation and friendship with a geographical focus on the Euro-Atlantic region and the foreign policies of Britain and the Nordic states. Haugevik holds a PhD in political science from the University of Oslo. Following Kristin, we have Eivind Svensson, who will talk about the long durée of Norway's alliance membership. What kind of an ally has Norway's, Norway been? Eivind Svensson is senior research fellow in the research group on global order and diplomacy at NUPI. So the same as Kristin. The core themes in his research are foreign policy, diplomacy, and security and defense policy. His PhD is from the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. Finally, Rasmus Hinrén will comment on the previous presentations. Rasmus Hinrén is ministerial advisor and team leader for EU and NATO policy at the Ministry of Defense of Finland. Previously, he was the head of international relations at the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. He has worked in the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, dealing with security and defense policy. He has held defense advisor posts in Brussels and Washington. And after the speakers, we will conclude with an open discussion with questions from the audience. So please bear that in mind. But now I would like to invite Ambassador Strömmen to give his opening remarks. Varsågod. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to say a few words at the opening. You didn't come here to listen to, uh, uh, to me. I'm looking forward to the researchers and to the comments, but uh, but uh, this is too good an opportunity to say at least one or two things. So thanks a lot for that opportunity. Two, uh, I have to say I'm, um, I'm a bit afraid of my ophthalmologist. I was born with very strange eyes and he is a strict man. So he tells me you have to tell every audience you speak to which eye that works. And it's my left eye. It's my left eye that works. I know I can look very confusing, but give me an extra chance. Give me an extra chance if I look distracted or arrogant or something. This is the one that works. The other one just goes away. Uh, if the left one goes away in the same manner as the right one, you can carry me out of here. That, uh, then, then we can do something else. Well, uh, to, um, 
to start to try to start off. Finnish and Swedish membership, and I will we, we really have to deal with them together. Membership of NATO is an old Norwegian dream, not only because you want to be a good neighbor and a, and, and a good friend and sibling, but it's also good for our own security. There's an enormous amount of self-interest in this as well. But when I, I'm an old guy, I started out in 1984 in the foreign ministry, and I had a very strict and old-fashioned director general. He ran a very tight ship. And he told us the following. He told us that every time someone in particularly in NATO, but also in America, other places that I've spent most of my, my uh, diplomatic life uh, dealing with uh, the Americans. Uh, every time someone speaks badly about Finland or start to use the word Finlandization, which he said is very strange and doesn't really mean a lot. You will find that out over the years. But he said every time someone does that, no matter how junior you are, you should get up and defend the Finns. And if you don't remember anything else to say, you should say that it's much more complicated than what you just said, even if you didn't understand what that person was saying. And that was, a, I remember I did it twice. Uh, I did it twice uh, in my very, uh, and it was in a way a useful thing. Norway, without going through the whole of history, Norway and Finland, does not have the same historical baggage when it comes to Russia. Not at all. And to this. But we are, it's like an agora. We arrived at the same place, and I believe that at the moment we hold very similar views on what the security situation is like in our part, uh, in our part of the world. But we arrived there through very different avenues. In spite of having both of us in spite of having both of us, land borders, land borders with, uh, with Soviet Union slash uh, uh, Russia. Sweden is in that aspect slightly different because it, there is a difference between having a maritime border and we certainly have a maritime border with the Russians, and, uh, but Sweden has maritime. The land border issues brings certain, uh, certain common aspects. Our land border is uh, way up in the north, but it has, I wouldn't say dominated, but it's been an enormous element of our, for, uh, our foreign policy over the years. I see it in the, in the, Nyberg, in, the in, in the audience, and he once told me that someone gave you the impression that about half a million people lives in Kirkenes, in eastern Finnmark. Well, in that, I'll give you 10,000, and then I'm being very generous. It's not... 500,000, it's, it's, uh, it's 10,000. Now, where are we at the moment? Why are we here today? What are we going to focus on? First and foremost, the terrible war of aggression that we're seeing in, in uh, Ukraine means, of course, that there are uh, a lot of bad things, but it opened up again, not for the first time in Finnish history, if you allow me, although I'm not an expert, but not for the first time in Finnish history. Geopolitical, geopolitical uh, uh, things opened up a historic opportunity to change, to change things. Finland has been through that over the last, uh, let's say, 110 years or, uh, or so uh, many times. And all of a sudden, out of this terrible sort of new situation, came an opportunity for Swedish and Finnish uh, integration into NATO. It will give us strategic depth it will open up a lot of issues for us. Cooperation will simply for the fact of things like logistics change. Finland and Sweden hold, holds uh, uh, most of its assets in the south. We hold almost everything in the north, just to start there. Infrastructure in this country is, I've only been a two and a half month, but it doesn't take long to find out it's north-south mostly. It will have to be focused, and the military people are already there on east-west. At some point, that will, that will come. 
probably in from Norwegian ports over Sweden and to, to Finland and to the e eastern border. It is, the military people say, probably the only, the only really sustainable way forward for su supply lines for heavy equipment, uh, 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 etc. That's going to have its own dynamic. That's going to have. Then there is the political element, the political cultural element. I'm not a military expert, but NATO is very different. It's an other multilateral animal. And every time one brings up a multilateral, you start thinking about, and you know, we, we, the, the Finns, just like you're used to the UN, there was the heydays of the OECE with, uh, 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 <coughs> with all its uh, uh, structures, and there's the, uh, is the EU, another historical uh, window that opened, uh, or was opened up by by, by geopolitics, but NATO is different. Well, why is NATO different? Well, and why doesn't really the word of Nordic bloc or a Northern bloc make sense in NATO? Well, it's got something to do with the way NATO works, that it's not only a multilateral organization where you discuss and come up with common attitudes or things, it actually is a serious military alliance built up that you should trust you should really trust. It's not on just another sort of brick in a wall of security that you build, although it's easy to think that way. It actually is the wall itself in many, uh, in many ways. There are other elements than, uh, than NATO, but it is a wall in itself. It's more than a, it's more than a, uh, it, it's more than a, 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 just a brick. NATO's political sort of culture is also, if we, if we take a step back and be honest, there is, because the U.S. brings so much of the resources to the table, that, of course, influence the whole political also culture of, of, uh, of, uh, of NATO. And so much of the military resources are, are held, for instance, outside of the European Union. UK, Turkey, and and of course the, uh, the uh, U US and, uh, and and Canada, and then and then Norway, Iceland. So it's a it's in a way it's in a way a different place and runs according to di because you always have this sort of practical element. There's the parallel military command structure, and the two sides in, engage and always always sort of thinks of each other. That's why we're facing a new uh, Finland and Sweden will be, f will be facing something else. Can our experience be helpful? Yes, I think maybe it can. I, didn't, I don't really like the word, what can you learn? Because I'm not sure we can teach. Finnish diplomats are very good. We don't need to teach them anything. And at some things, they're much better than us. For instance, shutting up <laughs> when you don't have anything to say which is quite often in diplomacy, to be honest, ladies and gentlemen, every now and then you should shut up, but you find it hard to do it, then you really should shut up. Uh, but sometimes silence is also a powerful, very powerful signal. I went to see, uh, there's a good Japanese ambassador in Helsinki, and I went to see him uh, just after I arrived, and he said that one of the things that the Japanese and the Finns have in common Many things, not only Moomin and all that stuff. But I said, one of the things we have in common that we're very good at is the appreciation of silence, even in diplomacy. He's got a point. He's got, they're, you're, uh, they're, uh, both the Japanese and Finns are much better at us, and to utilize or exploit it in many, in, in many ways. So I'm not sure we can teach them a lot. But of course, the experience over the year, maybe in particular, how to relate in such a context with the Americans, with their enormous military machine, their global presence, the fact that you, uh, that it's not the European Union, well, European Union, you at least got, a, got some countries with, uh, with, uh, with greater global reach than, than others, but in NATO, this is on a very different scale. The U.S. being so much focused on the Pacific, uh, of course, and have serious other, other, uh, uh, other interests than just those that focus on, uh, on the European, uh, on the, uh, on the European theater. 
Uh, Finland has uh, started this uh, pr uh, project. Uh, I speak a lot to uh, a good old friend and ambassador to Norway, Mika Naltel, who has been busy doing the DCA. I, I see some in the audience probably wait, just waited for me to mention the DCA, the Defense Cooperation Agreement with the Americans. You know, the NATO, NATO membership has to be seen in tandem with the, with, with the DCA. And of course, that is the, in a way then the introduction to the new security framework. The two things go together. And this, if we can be helpful, I hope Norway was helpful on the on the um, on the road to um, uh, to NATO membership. If, if, if NATO support support for NATO membership was 99 percent in Finland and uh, and 99 in Sweden, it was a hundred in Norway. It was a hundred percent, and then it's very hard to shut up, very very hard to shut to, sh uh, to shut up, but. But it has to be a decision by the country itself. Where to try in a way to influence was necessary. Everybody knew where, where, where we were coming from. We're looking forward to this relationship. Probably the experience can be of value. I think mostly that's got to do with what the Finns and, the, and, uh, and indeed also the Swedes will, will uh, uh, will feel that they need at some point. Maybe they don't need all that much. But, as I said, the bilateral uh, engagement with other members, including Turkey, including Turkey, uh, they've been there for a long time. They hold the southern flank. We hold the northern flank. We have gained some experiences, with more than willing to share those. Uh, of course, there. NATO is not, doesn't have geographical blocks, but of course the, uh, there, are, there are those that are more focused on the Mediterranean than others, and it's not necessarily us. Uh, those kind of things, Sweden and Finland, what might, might find useful to talk to us about. We're more than willing. I'm looking forward to the seminar. Uh, it's a great thing for us to see brilliant young researchers. So thanks a lot for organizing this, and thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to introduce them. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Strömmen. And now I invite all the speakers to, to take either the chair, and Ms. Haugevi can come here, and, and uh, Eivind, and also Mr. Hindre. Thank you, Katja, and thank you to uh, Katja and Matti Pesu and, and Fia for organizing this seminar. As Katja said, this is part of a one-year project that we are doing with Fia and Nufi, uh, funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Defense. And we had one previous event in Oslo in, in March, but of course uh, things were back then looking different from they are now, because things are happening very quickly in international politics these days. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and I'm happy to be able to talk about the Finnish-Norwegian relationship as well as uh, what Finland can potentially learn from Norway, although the ambassador I think is quite right in that there are pr uh, probably a mutual learning situation where Norway and Finland can draw from one another's experiences. So I've been asked to say a few words about what Finland can learn from Norway as a NATO ally with global ambitions. And I will turn to that task shortly. But first, allow me to just say a few words about the bilateral relationship. Because when President Minister visited Oslo last year, Norway's Prime Minister Jonas Garstøre said at the uh, press conference that Norway has no better friend, I have no better interlocutor than Finland and President Minister. So that's quite a, a strong statement, I would say. And inside observers have noted that the bilateral relationship has never been closer, never been better than it is today. I would say that Finland and Norway have, since 1918, enjoyed peaceful diplomatic relations. They've been good neighbors. But if I was to summarize the historical development of the relationship this last century, I would say that it has gone from, gone from being peaceful but somewhat distant to becoming politically estranged for a period before becoming gradually closer partners after the Cold War, and then now also becoming fully committed allies this last year. So it makes a, a very big change in the bilateral relationship as well. 
So what's the difference between being a partner and being an ally? Well, whereas the partnership tend to be broad in scope and more informal in structure, an alliance involves mutual and formally binding commitments in security and defense usually. So whereas security community theory, as described by international relations scholars, talk about how strategic interest-based collaboration gradually develops into a sense of weeness, a sense of community, I would say that in the case of Finland and Norway, it has been almost the other way around. So it started with the emergence of weeness, of identity, of a shared understanding of one another, and then now that weeness has ended up in a formal alliance. So both states are now committed to and sheltered by Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, extending Nordic sol solidarity commitments beyond peacetime for the first time. And being in NATO together increases, I would say, Finland and Norway's relevance to and attentiveness towards one another. It pushes the bilateral relationship up on, on both states' agenda, and it increases the potential for comparison and learning which I will return to very quite soon. In 2001, a Norwegian author, Alan Lo, uh, published a novel which was called Fakta om Finland, Facts about Finland. And in this novel, the protagonist is a young Norwegian brochure maker who is tasked by fin the Finnish embassy to make a brochure which will attract more Norwegian tourists to Finland. And the problem is that this brochure maker knows very little about Finland. He has never even been there. And so through the novel, he's struggling to come up with facts and stories that would make Norwegians travel to Finland. But it becomes increasingly clear that this protagonist is stuck in very old fashioned images about Finland. And at the time when the novel com came out 20 years ago, I think it smartly played on this idea that Finland was a close but somewhat distant and exotic and mysterious other in the neighborhood. So to many Norwegians, I think Nordic in practice equaled Scandinavian, and there was a key focus on Sweden and Denmark. Norwegian public knowledge of Finland was quite limited, and it, some explained this with reference to, to Finnish television theater, which was airing in Norwegian broadcasting company in the 1970s, which offered, I would say, a bit skewed image of, of Finland, uh, but I would say that after the Second World War, this has changed uh, dramatically. So Finland's entry into the EU made it a reference point for Norway in, in many other sorts of, of politics. And then came the 2000s, when Finland became synonymous with Nokia and high tech and PISA school rankings, where they consistently did better than Norway. And when I asked my 12-year-old about Finland, she said, well, what I know about Finland is that they are really happy there. So that's what she had learned in, in school, that Finland consistently ranks better than Norway on these happy indexes. So it would be my claim that Norwegians know a lot more about Finnish politics and society than they did 20 years ago when this Fakta om Finland, the facts about Finland, was written. And for this project, I went through Norwegian defense documents since 1995, and I found increasing references to Finland, not only the last year, but also in the build-up to the last year. So Finland was very often and increasingly mentioned in the context of the EU, the context of NATO as a third country that Norway was seeking closer collaboration with, but also as a reference point for Norwegian national models of different sorts, Norwegian practices, uh, where Norway increasingly looked to Finland to see for ways of doing things, to see for inspir inspiration, for comparison. And in recent years, Norway has also looked increasingly to Finland to learn about, for example, national territorial defense, the concept of total defense, and also cyber security. So what about the other way around? What can Finland learn from Norway as a long-standing NATO member? And my colleague Eivind will talk about the security and defense side in just a few minutes. So I will zoom out and talk a bit about the larger foreign policy issues. So how does being a member of a defense alliance influence a small state's room for foreign policy maneuver? And I understand why you asked the question, Katja and, and Matti, at this seminar, because there are some interesting similarities in uh, Norway and Finland's self-images and roles as foreign policy actors, I would say, despite the very different histories that we have. So first, I would say, 
that identity matters in foreign policy. The stories we tell about ourselves are also the stories that inform the foreign policy choices that we make. So foreign policy is about interests, it's about getting what the state and its population need and want, it's about security and economic gains. But it is also about building identities. It's about performing and protecting who the state is on the international arena, who it wants to be, its values, its beliefs, its beliefs. So to communicate this, which is what diplomats do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, to communicate the values and ideas and, and hopes of the state on the international arena. And so states, through their representatives, tell stories, stories that weave events, <laughs> facts, responses together that make sense of what's happening around us and make sense to the foreign policy responses that the state is engaged in. And at the same time, identities and stories are constantly changing. And while Norwegian foreign policy is often portrayed in terms like long lines, consensus, being recognizable, I would say it has also been updated and adapted a number of times. And Finland and Norway have some similarities in terms of their framework conditions for foreign policy. So they are both relatively young states. They are both located in the northern periphery. They are Nordic states, they are Arctic states, although in, in different ways. They have relatively small populations, they are sparsely populated countries, and they are both neighbors to Russia with a long history of making this delicate balancing act in the relationship. And then there are some important differences too, the ambassador was pointing uh, to many of them, uh, and Norway and, and Finland certainly also have different Arctic and Baltic identities, with, with Finland more oriented towards the Baltic Sea. There's the land and the, and the maritime dimension, there's the east and the west dimension, and there's of course also the length of the border towards Russia, which has also made the neighborly relations dif different. But relatively speaking, Norway and Finland are more similar than many other states on the international arena, and I would say that they are more similar within the Nordic context than they used to be. My second point uh, about how Norway operates in the world is that it's a balancing act. And Norway is, I would say, in its foreign policy, uh, always speaking about its firm belief and defend defense of the rules-based international order. So within this framework, the UN has been the bedrock NATO has been the cornerstone, the United States has been the closest bilateral partner, and Norway sees itself as closely associated with, but not part of the EU. It's an adaptive outsider, so it's not part of the EU, but then closely associated with, and opts in to many of the EU's foreign policy positions and choices. So Norway is closely associated with, but not part of the EU. And then finally, Norway is the devoted Nordist, and I would say increasingly so, increasingly committed to the Nordic cooperation. Norway has been a mem member of NATO since 1949. Um, and the division of labor is quite clear, I would say, between the Norwegian ministries. So it's, it's mainly in the Norwegian Ministry of Defense that there has been uh, a key focus on NATO. Whereas in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there have been a larger component, for example, on UN affairs. So there has been a division of labor as well in terms of how the, division, the, the different ministries have been uh, organizing themselves. Norway is an outsider of the EU, as I said, and Finland has been an outsider of NATO. And um, there are some similarities in this sense, I would say, because not being in the EU has at times been used as a reasoning in the Norwegian foreign policy discourse as to why Norway has an extended room for foreign policy maneuver. And I think that applies uh, to the Finnish context as well, that being non-aligned has extended Finnish foreign policy room for maneuver as well. So how do you combine being a defense ally with having an active normative foreign policy role? Uh, and in the Norwegian context, the self-identification, the narrative and the brand as a peace nation is relatively new, at least in its current form. So there's the policy of engagement, Norway as a big donor of development aid, uh, and also playing an active role in peace mediation in a number of contexts and countries. 
And this has been tied to long-standing historical lines, such as uh, Norway being a small country without a colonial past, Norway being the country that hands out the Nobel Peace Prize, the, successful, uh, the successfulness of, of, uh, of engagements in the past, the Oslo Agreement uh, and the process around that as something that built to Norway's reputation as well. Um, and scholars point out that these things have somehow gone together with the identity as a committed NATO ally. Because uh, Norway has been engaged in policy engagement and peace mediation for its own sake, but also as an asset in the sense that it has given Norway a voice and a seat around the table in Washington. So there's a principle of impartiality when assuming the role as mediator, but having Washington's ears and, 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 and voice and, and being listened to and the support has also been a key. So conversely, uh, Norway also acquired a voice and a seat around the table by taking on this, this role. At the same time, uh, when Norway did take on this, this role and identity, NATO was of course in a different place than it is now. It was to a large part out of area. It was not operating in the near abroad. And that is different these days. And so combining these roles could become more difficult in the years to come, uh, precisely because geopolitics is not what it used to be. There is more uh, geopolitical rivalry. There are more competing interests. So the room for maneuver may as well has, have been uh, smaller than it used to be. But while non-alignment has been uh, a Finnish asset in a sense, in its, its role as a peace mediator, then Norway has combined this role. Uh, alignment combined with the role as a peace mediator. And last year I was part of this research project where we looked at Norway's term as an elected member of the UN Security Council. And when talking to other delegations at the UN Security Council, uh, the other countries, we found that the NATO membership didn't come up as much. It didn't come up as something that uh, people were particularly concerned about or, or, or aware of. Uh, but rather they noted this sort of the long-standing lines and reputation, uh, knowing what you get, being operative, being a small state with the ambition to be impartial. They noted this as something that was important rather than uh, the formal alliance. So how do we make sense of this all? Well, uh, Finland has, uh, I said that Norway has been an adaptive outsider of the EU. Finland has in many ways been an adaptive outsider of, of NATO. And now I assume that Finland will uh, take on the role as an adaptive insider uh, and change its foreign policy, change its narrative so that it goes together with this new context, with the new, um, with the new geopolitic, geopolitical reality of today. Of course, the narrative about world politics is shifting overall. It was easier, perhaps, to be a peace nation in the late 1990s and the early 2000s than it is today. And NATO is back to the territorial defense, it's back to the near abroad. But there's also the potential uh, entry of a new President Trump or something, someone like him in the US, and that too could change uh, the dynamics as we see them today. The brochure maker in Al Slu's novel, he, he finished the brochure, but then it was lost in a fire. And that brought a sense of relief to our protagonist, because now uh, perhaps he could update his images about Finland. And I will conclude there, uh, and I look forward to our discussion, where we will also learn more about what Finland and Norway can learn from one another. Thank you. Thank you, Christine Haugevik. And now I invite Evid Svensson to continue on the security and defense aspects. Thank you, Katja, and thank you to FIA for uh, hosting this seminar and inviting us to come here in uh, the best month in Helsinki, November. <laughs> um, it's not too bad. It's kind of like Oslo the, uh, today. Uh, I, I should start also with the, the third strike on our title because also I'm a little bit un at an ease with the what can Finland learn title that we've opted for here. But I guess we can have a discussion and I, I think learning goes both ways as Kristin ended on there. 
Also, I was asked to talk about the long durée of Norway's uh, time as a NATO member, which is also a humbling experience because, uh, or a humbling task to be uh, performing because it's 75 years of history, uh, but there has been a lot written. And, um, you know, Norway's NATO membership is very interested, um, interesting for historians. Mm -hmm. So in Norwegian language, we have a huge amount of literature on larger and smaller quarrels domestically and within NATO in these 75 years that uh, Norway has been a member of NATO. So I thought I would just start by saying that Norway's experiences uh, during World War II and the German occupation was central when Norway decided uh, to land firmly in the West and to sign the Washington Treaty. Um, but actually from, from 1945, the government in exile in London, um, the Norwegian security policy was actually going to be based on uh, uh, bridge building, it was called a bridge building policy. And that meant that Norway wanted to be a bridge builder between great powers to foster cooperation between them, and Norway's security was going to be catered for in the UN Security Council. Now, um, that changed quickly, and these historians that I just mentioned have debated a lot whether actually not joining the Western Bloc at all was uh, a realistic option back then. I think they somehow agree now that uh, uh, the Soviets weren't particularly surprised when Norway uh, joined in and signed the, the Washington Treaty. But at the same time, you know, those that count, uh, argue against it re remind us that actually the Soviets liberated our northernmost, uh, the northernmost part of our country, Finnmark, uh, in 1944 from uh, the Germans. And um, instead of occupying it, uh, they actually just went back and gave our, our land back to us. So, so there, there was some debate about that, but it was a a clear stance uh, when this whole bridge building policy turned out to be impossible um, and not cater for uh, Norwegian security. So that decision was anchored in this uh, long durée of uh, that uh, historian Rolf Tomnes, one of our uh, strongest uh, military historians in Norway, has called Norway's small state realism, which is based on the significance of being protected by greater powers, but also keeping them at a distance. We'll come back to that. Uh, as well as having international law and the global order of some kind of sense um, as a safety net for the country. So that, that really is, uh, that explains some 120 years of Norwegian for, uh, security policy thinking, I think. So I think broadly the Norwegian defense and NATO debates do not change all that much. It's also remarkably stable after 75 years. There are some sort of um, things that we keep coming back to. Um, of course it does so um, uh, when it changes and when policy changes, it does so in a very banal point. Welcome to NATO. Your defense policy and security policies will change in accordance with uh, NATO policy and NATO planning. You will be part of making that policy. Uh, so that really is, a, is a, ma uh, a main change that occurred has occurred over the last 75 years. But also Norway has historically tried to maximize its own operational and planning structures outside of NATO structures, keep them at a distance. Uh, but this has become increasingly difficult in the last 20 years or so, especially after major transformation uh, in the aftermath of 9-11. But still, I, I would say, and it's a, it's a big point, the discourse and debate about Norway's role in NATO has been remarkably stable. And it largely plays out against a tension between two core concepts. I know a lot of people in this room will know these two concepts, um, and they m seem odd often to the international community or the international audience, but it is a balance between deterrence, deterring Russia, and reassurance, reassuring Russia. And again, that has been the driving uh, discussion in Norwegian NATO debates uh, for 75 years. So in essence, it means that while it was and still is important to see uh, or to deter against the Soviets and then the Russians um, by uh, catering for that, by being a member of a military alliance, um, Norway has sought to reassure the Russians of its intentions and by placing self-imposed restrictions, another term that some of you may know, Norway's self-imposed restrictions on security policy. So this is known as balansepolitiken, the policy of balance in Norwegian security policy. 
And actually it has a, uh, so this is reassuring and deterring the Russians, but it also has an in, in, inter, uh, no, intra-alliance dynamic here, which is integration through NATO, but also shielding, keeping at a distance, especially uh, uh, further north. So really this policy uh, of balance has, we could say, has three main pillars to it. One is the base policy, no permanent NATO bases on Norwegian soil in peacetime. Second, no nuclear weapons on Norwegian soil. And third, limitations on allied activities in the uh, very far north of Norway. So attempting to balance between deterring the Russians and reassuring them still to this day is a cornerstone in Norwegian security policy. And I think uh, we're seeing a shift in Norway as well in over the last year, retired generals, politicians, uh, especially conservative politicians and others have started to question the viability and if we should abandon the concept altogether, should Norway's security policy not be based uh, on reassurance anymore because of the nature of uh, Russia and the war, of course. Uh, but it still is, it is a debate that we're having, I would say. I would also say Norway has, we, over lunch today, we talked about the, the fin, Finnish debate being very hawkish. Uh, the, in the context of what I just said, I think there is, has been a, a discursive shift in Norwegian defense debate also to be co towards becoming more hawkish, questioning this reassurance policy over the last year because of Russia's uh, aggression and um, war on Ukraine. Okay, back to... I got very contemporary. That was not the long durée. That was uh, that was a policy, recent policy. So, th if there is a major shift occurring in like a watershed moment, I would say in the 75 years that Norway has been a member of NATO, uh, this collapse of the Soviet Union was very, very monumental for the NATO uh, alliance. Uh, and Norway has of course adapted to changes in the international context and among NATO allies. Um, and I th the 1990s was, you know, this period, you all probably know the, the transition from collective defense uh, to building armed forces fit for out of area operations. And then at some point, not too long ago, back to collective defense. But I think it was a lot of research on Norwegian defense transition in the 1990s argue and find that Norway was quite slow. So territorial defense is, has always been uh, much more comfortable in Norwegian security debates. Um, then uh, sort of this out of area that uh, emerged, especially after, uh, well, in the 1990s. So that was uh, quite slow, but Norway came, uh, of course, pressure from NATO allies to, to transform the armed forces, to be prepared to do counterinsurgency, to do out of area operations, and eventually, but arguably one of the last NATO countries to successfully, successfully do that. So but I think also I want to, to mention uh, on the question of the U.S., um, wanted to stop by, uh, by Afghanistan in this discussion. Norway as a NATO member, so spent a lot of time. Uh, eventually, the the um, the doctrine, so to say, on Norway's contribution in Afghanistan was, um, you know, to g go in together and out together. And this major national review of the Nor Norway's performance in Afghanistan basically saw that there were three tar uh, you know, goals with Norway's contributions in Afghanistan. Fighting terror, building a state, and um, have a good relationship to, to NATO and especially the US. And the report concluded it failed on building a uh, functioning state. It failed regards uh, to um, fighting terrorism but it did succeed in showing that Norway is a very loyal ally to the US. We also heard about, so just probe some, uh, some themes about similarities and differences. Of course, in all of these periods, Norway has seen, you know, during the Cold War, very strategically interesting geographic position, which would also, you know, Finland would be uh, aligned to that. But then with, with these transitions in the 90s and out of area operations, uh, Norway had to struggle a bit to, to sort of uh, get NATO's eyes up to the north because it wasn't that important, but that has of course also now changed completely. And for Norway that is especially pertaining to the maritime domain though. Okay, let's return to reassurance. Um, I think the concept of reassurance has been stretched a lot recently, even though reassurance deterrence is the main sort of conceptual fight in, over Norway and how to deal with uh, Russia. 
uh, following, uh, there was an example in 2014 after um, Russia annexed Crimea and Norway sent troops to the eastern flank. The uh, government uh, said that it was, uh, this was done under the umbrella of reassurance because it was reassuring uh, Norway's allies on the eastern flank. So that shows that the concept is around to structure the debate, but it completely changes meaning. Um, so it is clear that Norway is also a changing country in, in light of the current uh, geopolitical situation, uh, which also is why so it's difficult to have this learning thing here, because I think Norway is learning a lot these days as well. And Finland can learn uh, Norway a lot, at least about uh, deterrence and uh, sort of the how to balance having a neighbor that you have unfriendly relationship, uh, an unfriendly relationship with. And it's also the problem of this reassurance and deterrence in Norwegian foreign policy is that, as has been uh, pointed out uh, by my colleague Julia Wilhelmsen at Nupi, it doesn't really matter how you think about it, it matters how they perceive it. Uh, whether it's reassurance or deterrence or whatever you want to call it, uh, in the end of the day, it matters how, your, um, how Russia views it. And uh, Norway is now uh, an unfriendly country. Which is, a, which is a new development in uh, Norwegian-Russian relations. So I thought I would end on public opinion. Public opinion uh, in Norway is strong um, when it comes to support for NATO. Uh, it's, uh, and it has increased since 2022, but it has changed mostly in relation to Russia. So it is a, cl a clear shift in the public opinion that Russia needs to be deterred that Ukraine needs to get all the support it uh, needs, and also uh, that the sanctions needs to continue. So the only sort of reassurance in the Norwegian public opinion these days is a very clear, uh, and especially in the northern part of the country, a clear uh, desire to see Norway distinguishing the Putin regime from the Russian people. Uh, that's at some, I don't have the numbers, some 92% of the population says that. Okay, so I think we you know, we live in unsettled times. I don't know if I painted that picture bleak enough, but um, you know, the, f the fact that even though the Norwegian security and defense debate is structured around the same concepts and has had sort of age old conversations, I think policy is changing and Norway is also learning. So I think, uh, you know, it's the same conclusion as the other two. Learning is likely to go both ways here, uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Eivind. And uh, then we move on to the comments by Rasmus Hindren. Rasmus, do you want to come up here? Thank you so much uh, to, to FIA for, for putting this together and, and thank you very much for uh, the NUPI colleagues for, for excellent presentations. Uh, just to maybe state a couple of the obvious things that were already um, mentioned here. The fact that um, yes, we can learn uh, from Norway, we can learn from each other, but most importantly we need to keep the close uh, engagement and, and dialogue and uh, try to, to face, face the changing circumstances together because indeed it is a time of um, uncertainty, it is a time for, for discursive uh, shifts uh, in, in, in our countries and, and we need to manage that, those in the best way that we can. And for that it's also uh, important to, 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 talk to, the, to talk to the NGOs and, and, and uh, researcher colleagues. So um, again, just to, to state the obvious uh, things, uh, Finland and Norway are, are really close to, to one another in, in all those terms that, uh, that Christine mentioned in terms of geography, but also uh, many of our approaches. And I should also underline that there was a lot of pre-existing uh, bilateral cooperation before uh, Finland uh, joined NATO and regional cooperation, of course, and in the defense context, uh, it was uh, mostly taking place in the context of uh, NORDEFCO, the, the Nordic Defense Cooperation. Uh, bilaterally uh, and in defense side, uh, the industrial cooperation has been a, a key part of uh, a key pillar of our cooperation. There's security of supply um, 
cooperation, there's, there's regional uh, exercising and, and a lot of other things. So this is just to say that there, there was a, already a, a strong base on, on which to, to build uh, our, our current and, and forthcoming cooperation. And indeed that there are new opportunities, new possibilities uh, that, that come from, from the Finnish. And I should mention also Swedish um, um, accession to NATO. And, and this is something that has to be stated that we are very much looking forward to, to, the, to the Swedish accession that is um, hopefully taking place uh, really soon. Um, throughout the process in the, in the last year or so, uh, we've been talking a lot with, with Norwegian colleagues uh, and, and especially in terms of uh, benchmarking certain issues when it comes to, to processes and structures, but also understanding the dynamics uh, of the of the alliance, the, the political dynamics and, and, and the processes. And this has been really, really important. And it was also mentioned um, that the DCA uh, was mentioned, and I think that's another great example uh, of, of an issue area where Finland uh, had a good um, engagement with Norway and, and uh, learned a lot during that process. But I'm sure also that there will be a time when when, when Norway perhaps can also also learn from Finland. Um, maybe just to reflect uh, on a couple of the points that were, were raised by, by colleagues, um, I think one was that caught my, my uh, ear was, was the global context. How do we manage um, the current situation with growing interdependence? Uh, how do we manage the, the changes in the political dynamics in the US? How do we manage the global south? These are all, all uh, part of the challenge that we, we have to face. And, and I think, again, this is something where we, we should be comparing notes uh, with, with Norway. The other point was the fact that uh, it's been 75 years. Well, next year it will be 75 years of, of NATO. Uh, there's a long history, uh, and Norway has lived through that history, uh, whereas Finland has not. So it also means that Norway has seen a lot of the things that we are facing now for the first time in or a, a certain variants of those issues Norway has already seen. They have seen uh, certain ups and downs. They have seen some um, issues that prove di divisive uh, within the alliance, but every time uh, they, they, the challenges were overcome. So I think this is also another aspect that uh, we, we need to 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 learn from that history and, and of course then Finland will also um, be, be part of the, the future history, so to speak. Um, well, the discursive shift uh, in Norway, uh, I, I noted that and I think that's something that we need to follow closely. I think it's just a, a reflection of the fact that the, we are we are living in a time of, uh, of uh, pretty rapid changes and, and, and uncertainty. So there needs to be obviously an adaptation uh, of, our, of our approaches, of our policies. Uh, so, so this is quite, um, quite understandable. Uh, maybe just to note also what happened now during the 90s and, and the early 2000s with the, let's, let's call it the expeditionary phase uh, and the fact that, uh, to some extent, Finland stayed out out of that uh, wave, uh, keeping to its uh, its uh, structures and, and policy of, of mostly mostly nationally based uh, and oriented defense forces, but uh, but of course Finland also joined the, the crisis management operations. But now, what's uh, wh what's the what's the approach there? I think it's the fact is that there has to be. Uh, a focus on collective uh, defense and on, on territorial defense, obviously. But it also means that we have to combine that with interoperable and, and with deployable forces also to, to, to a certain extent, because crisis management is still required, but also in case of uh, Article 5 operations, uh, there, there could be a need for deployable uh, forces. So I think it's, it's also a balance we need, balance we need to, 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 to look at. Um, I think now I, I would maybe uh, utilize the, the, the Finnish superpower that the ambassador alluded to, and that was the strategic silence uh, to, to maybe uh, to, to hear from, from the audience uh, and, and get to the discussion part, but uh, really 
thanks again for, for your insights and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus Hindren, for, for your comments. And uh, we have half an hour to, for the discussion. And uh, just when the audience is now contemplating the smart questions or comments, I have a few, you know, preliminary questions. You, you know, I will throw out to you, and then you can, you know, either answer them later on or, or choose not to. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, perhaps to to Rasmus Hinrén that I Finland is working on a new government report on defense matters, and that will come out uh, later but perhaps there are some insights whether Norway, how much Norway will be mentioned and our relationship developed in, in that uh, report. Perhaps that's something to, I know you can't reveal of course everything, but maybe just some hints on, on where we are going in that uh, report. Also perhaps to the ambassador that where do you see that the Norwegian and Finnish relations would be if there hadn't been a Russian aggression of against Ukraine. So did Russia in fact bring us together uh, more than we expected? And to Christine perhaps also on, in Finland there's all, you know, often comparison to Norway and Norwegian foreign policy. And, and uh, I think the latest it occurred now when we talked about UN voting and the war on Gaza. So um, I hear that Norway is still uh, talking to Ga uh, Hamas and uh, still giving aid and Norway is voting with the Global South. So any reflections on the differences here to Finland and the other Nordic countries perhaps. So if you wish to pick up on any of these, uh, feel free to do so and uh, then I will open the floor for the audience and any, any comments or questions from there. And the mic, we must pass it on and, and you can turn it on from there's a button. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll just try to tackle the first one and, and, and uh, give colleagues the floor then. But uh, yes, indeed, uh, the government uh, report on, on defense is, is uh, being prepared, as is also the government report on uh, security and foreign policy. And uh, of course, the defense report will, will take some of its cues uh, from, from that uh, other report. Uh, I couldn't tell to which extent uh, Norway will be featured in it, but I'm sure it will and I'm sure it will reflect the, the, the growing uh, cooperation both bilaterally and in, in different multilateral fora. I think that's, that's all, I can, all I can say about that now. Um, could I try the one, where, we, where would we have been if there hadn't been an attack on the, on the Ukraine? Because I, sh I should have said something about that. Well, I'm not sure it was the attack on Ukraine. I think we need to go back to December 21 and Putin's insistence on security guarantees. Because I remember when that came up and you understood that this sort of, if you allow me the expression, that sort of Yalta way of thinking about the world, that uh, we were actually in a way still uh, just after Yalta, and uh, it, it gave it gave sort of reflections back not only to 1948 but even to before. So it was not for us to decide, but the demand for the, the, what really was said then at that point was very very hard from a perspective that you know from from. Uh, um, I was in uh, I was in London at the time, but I uh, spoke a lot to the people in Oslo that how can you know Finland and Sweden cannot live with this, but it's not for our, us to decide. So in a way, having then you know Crimea in the because I've thought a lot. I was political director when uh, in 2014, and Crimea was uh, was really also a bridge too far. And the response to what happened in Crimea was one thing, but let's leave that uh, aside for the time being. But when then the security guarantees demand came on the, tem uh, uh, on the table in the context that it did in the late fall of 21, 
that was across the Rubicon in a way more. And then you could almost say that uh, one was not that surprised when the invasion came of Ukraine because it follows the same sort of way of totally unacceptable thinking. So where would we have been without the security guarantee, uh, guarantee issues? I think we would have been much closer, but in a way more sort of respect, a, a, a relationship that would have become narrower and uh, you know closer and closer, simply also because of uh, the uh, you know, uh, Russian foreign policy in our uh, in 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 general, but not to the not to the to the extent that we're seeing at the moment. I mean, uh, it was it was of course the NATO decision and the fact that we have an ongoing war. And I'm not drawing, and I'm not saying that the war itself didn't have a massive impact. It did, but from a sort of international law perspective and a security per uh, perspective, it was the guarantee. So we, I think we would have been much closer, but in a way m much more remote than one is uh, at the moment. Still, with a lot of respect, you know, there is a lot of respect for Finland, and also Finland's way through history in. Uh, in uh, Norway, I said it's not a parallel exercise, but uh, without saying too much, you know, we've also been dominated by our neighbors, and I'll stop there. Uh, and thank you for the question about the UN resolution, Katja. I think it's a good example of the complexity, uh, in a sense, because it also shows how the Nordic countries do not always uh, vote in the same way or take position in the some same way. They didn't reason in this case in the same way either. Uh, but it also shows, which is interesting, I think, in the present context, that uh, NATO membership wasn't really a key variable in terms of how uh, how states voted uh, in relation to this this particular resolution. Uh, so it shows, in a sense, that there is a, is a room for maneuver in, in making different arguments. And, and I think also the Nordic countries, in a sense, also agreed that they, they had a, a similar sort of wish for how this process should turn out, but they had some differences in how they interpreted the wording, uh, which I think is quite typical for the Nordic states as well, that they are quite uh, sensitive towards uh, different signaling and different ways of, of reasoning. But, uh, but I think it's an interesting case in point as well, and, and, and it shows that being a NATO ally doesn't necessarily lead to, lead to uh, predictable or, 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 or given outcomes, in a sense. Thank you so much for your answers. And uh, I already see some hands up. And uh, if I may start, the first hand was René Nuber. Please go ahead, and then we have Torsten. Thank you very much for the presentation and congratulations to the both institutions for this kind of a, uh, of a seminar and cooperation. I was intrigued by Kirsten's expression, adaptive outsider. And uh, uh, I'm sure it could be applied on Finland's relationship to NATO, but it really applies for uh, Norwegian's relationship with the European Union. And when uh, uh, the ambassador uh, talked about ag an agora where we have met now, my question is, <laughs> do, you, do you perceive an, an a EU membership for Norway in the coming dec decade ahead? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this is not a joke. I'm just looking at how how Norway supports Ukraine. It's, 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 both, it's both armaments and treasure. And the Norwegian, uh, uh, Norwegian uh, share is important. Norway is an important, uh, uh, important partner. But Norway is kind of an outsider in, th in the context when these things are discussed in the European Union. You're always, uh, uh, you're always welcome to pay. That is something you've no noticed and been happy, w and happy with for, many, for many years now. Of course, uh, uh, talk about Euro, uh, let, let me just say, uh, say that uh, uh, I don't see, s uh, I, I would say that S Sweden will in the coming years uh, become a Euro country, uh, 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 also an, ex uh, an expression of adaptive, on something adaptive uh, uh, outsider. The interesting thing, what Wegger, what you said was, of course, the supply lines west-east. Do you perceive NATO, uh, NATO um, uh, infrastructure money in here? Because we all know that we need, an, uh, w there's, a, uh, there's an evident need for, a, for, uh, for uh, connections. There's an evident need for, for a railway connection because the Kiruna uh, uh, railroad is, 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 too, uh, is too, 
uh, is too busy, it, it, will not, it, will, it doesn't suffice. Do you think there will be could, uh, this could be something where, where money would be found, uh, not only from NATO, but also from Norway, from the Norwegian side? And then just let, uh, one s uh, final point, I don't want, uh, want it to be too long here. Eivind, uh, 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 when you talk about reassurance, I was a little bit struck by that. Is that really, do you, is reassurance, reassuring Russia still a foundation of Norwegian security policy? Uh, 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 I would say that this was this might be the place where Finland should not learn from Norway in, in the present uh, in the present circumstances, where the Finnish position has been that NATO membership without any qualifications, uh, and uh, and this is this is I mean the, uh, the question of of uh, nu nukes is not is is uh, is, uh, is is artificial. There is no question about that. But even bases. Uh, bases are not, uh, there will be no, uh, uh, no bases in Finland because there's no need for a basis. Uh, of course, the Norwegian history is different. 75 years is a totally different situation. But you still talk about reassurance. I was, I was a little bit struck by that. Okay, perhaps we take a short round of replies and, and then we move on to Ambassador Torstila. But maybe we start with, with uh, Strömmen here. Or? And there was at least a question of money you know, for the railway? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. yeah. C could I first start, uh, start by the one that uh, gives you an excellent opportunity to lose your job, EU membership? <laughs> uh, you, have the, you have all the possibilities in the world to, uh, to end, uh, end right here. No, you know, Rene, I, I was around when the government, that when Norway voted the second referendum no in the 90s. And after two referendums turning down EU membership, and for the, the first one in the early 1970s, I'm born 59, I grew up in the 1960s, Norway was not a wealthy place. Then came oil and gas, energy, energy a lot of things finally came uh, our way in the 60s and the 70s. Norway peaked in the year 1264 and it's been downhill ever since, almost uh, until we got to the sort of the 1970s. Uh, All wars and things we were dragged into, uh, uh, into, but then a lot of things changed for us. But then 20 years after that, the population again turned it down. And Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was prime minister of the time, and a rather forceful character, if you allow me to say so, she said that we've had enough. Not only have I had enough, but you have also had enough. That we will not ask a third time. There will then be a, a very strange perception and how the how sort of the political, the, uh, the uh, you know the, the political environment addresses such an issue. So we are then. And we came up with, uh, and Jacques Delors and Mrs. Brundtland came up with this idea about the European economic area, which we are trying to uh, uh, use to the maximum. And that is our legacy. That, you know, that is our destiny, in a way. That's where we're, we're sort of stuck. And we, we work with that. And it, on balance, I think most people think it works rather well. You could always come up with it shouldn't be that way or that way. But we try to be a good partner, although I know we're a small one. But we're helped by the fact that at least in one or two sectors, you're so large that you really, you really count energy being the obvious one. So we saw that during that. Briefly, infrastructure. I think the infrastructure thing will be, yes, it will be financed, but it's such an obvious thing that it will happen. And it will drive a lot of the policy things as well, because so large infrastructure operations and change of of planning, etc. I think, but in first, you I think we should leave it to the military people to see what really would work, what you need in an integrated structure, and then I'm pretty sure the money will come afterwards. But, and this gives me, and I will stop there, an opportunity to say the following. We have to get Sweden into NATO. Both for Finland and for Norway, this project is not complete. Or it's not good at all. Well, it's good that we got Sweden, but it's not fulfilled before we get Sweden. And through, for many, many years, and through history, it's been this way. Anything that's good for Sweden is also good for Norway, and I assume it's also good for Finland. I'm pretty sure it is. And anything that's bad for Sweden is ultimately also 
bad for us and I think for Sweden. It is very important. They are, after all, the largest country in Northern, in Northern Europe. Uh, Finland has its history with uh, Sweden, which is very different, again, from, uh, from Norway and very close. But on the other hand, anything that is good for Sweden. So it is really important. It can hardly be overestimated how long. Uh, and, in the in and the infrastructure side of this is only one example. There are political, there are economic, there anything. We've got to get Sweden in. Thank you. Eivind, do you want to respond? Yes, I would. Uh, can I, if I could start with the EU question as well. Uh, I've worked a lot with uh, the EU question in Norway and surveys on EU membership, potential EU membership. Um, I'm, I'm more, um, as we are in, in Helsinki, I can say I am more uh, positive, perhaps, than uh, <laughs> Ambassador Sturman. I think um, I think, uh, but it, it's it's hard to convince the public, you know, what can trump um, fisheries and agriculture to shift the majority in favor of joining the EU, because it's basically those two things. We have protection of those two things in the current arrangement. And uh, it seems that secu the security argument has been super effective so far. So this discourse of the EU gathering around security doesn't really uh, bite that much. So you have the question of sanctions. You know, the, the media wrote about the fact that, well, all these sanctions Norway are imposing are, are being negotiated by council uh, representatives while Norway is at a cafe in Rue de la, de la Loire, right? So and this is a story about Norwegian EU relations, uh, but it doesn't really uh, uh, shift the opposition but, um, or the opinions, but opinions have changed. So the most recent opinion polls show that there is a clear increase in people that uh, would like to join the EU if they had the option. And of course, there's a very big don't know uh, group in this, every time in these opinion polls. And if you have a proper process, if you have a, you know, you decide to have a referendum, so you have a campaign, uh, I think it's much closer than it's ever been. And how much was it in 94? 2%, 1%. So I think it's, it's not unlikely that that will happen. And the question of reassurance, yes. We still talk about reassurance, and I think, um, and the government is talking about reassurance. Uh, but now, of course, they they state uh, communication, and, and of course, I think you would know th uh, this from the inside. But um, we d we talk to them, uh, but communication is minimal. But we inform them of it. Uh, for instance, one reassurance measure is to inform the Russians about exercises. That's really the level of reassurance that we do these days. So that's sort of what that means. And I'm not sure if reassurance is the best, we've, we've had this discussion, the best uh, translation of the word beruligelse, which is the Norwegian word uh, for it. But it's it's still uh, used, but, of, but the debate since 22 has been, should we abandon the concept of reassurance altogether? But it's still in the debate, I would say. And I was ambivalent about it, let me, let me you know, sorry. I was ambivalent about this in my talk because who should learn from who here? <laughs> and maybe that's a, that's a uh, difficult, uh, and I'm gonna leave it open, you know, I'm just a petty researcher, but it's a question of uh, there will, will be a Russia in the future. And I think that's sort of what drives Norwegian thinking about this. There will be a post Putin Russia, uh, there will be uh, 120 million Russians. And how do you deal with those if you only have deterrence and if you've built down all sort of cooperative structures. So that's sort of the Norwegian normative side to why reassurance is important to take care of. I just think in, in prolongation of your question as well, it shows the debate that we are having internally in Norway now, what, what the concept of reassurance entails. Because on the one hand, you could imagine, you know, diplomatic dialogue, which I think is, is the way it is interpreted at, at in, in many contexts. But of course, at the very minimum, as Sovin is saying, it could also simply be about preventing misunderstandings to make sure yet that you don't, by default or, b or by, by coincidence, actually escalate tensions, for example, in the high north. So I think that's also a part of, of what is uh, traditionally understood with the reassurance policy. And then just one, one note on your question about the EU membership and Norway as an adaptive outsider, which I think is interesting. And actually, in prolongation of, of Finland's decision to apply for NATO membership, we had a discussion uh, with colleagues concerning what would it take for Norway to do a similar U-turn, in a sense, to, to decide quite swiftly to, to, to decide to, to um, apply for EU membership again, and especially given these historical 
uh, experiences. And I think, uh, and this is my personal opinion, I, th I think they would have to take something similar to what uh, happened to Finland. They would, you would have to have some kind of dramatic shift in the circumstances that made it um, urgent to consider membership again. Because I think the, the political constellation of coalition governments in Norway, the composition of the parliament, as well as the, as the opinion polls that have been steadily, well, not, not that high in support for membership, I think it would have to take something big. And in my mind, I was thinking about something along the lines of the pandemic and the vaccines. If there had been a situation where you wouldn't get access to the vaccines, uh, and you had to be a member of the EU to do so, I think that is something that could have shifted the, pop the opinion polls quite shift uh, swiftly. Uh, but otherwise, Norway is kind of covered through its arrangements, and as an adaptive outsider, it gets to opt in on, on quite a few things on the EU side. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have two more questions here. So, uh, Ambassador Torstila and the gentleman in the front row. Let's take the two questions together. Thank you very much. My name is, name is Petri Torsti, I'm a former diplomat. Um, Ambassador Stelma, welcome to Finland, welcome to Helsinki. I'm sure, I'm sure that your assignment will be very different from the one of your predecessors. Um, in, your sweet, in your speech you said that NATO is an organization of trust. Trust between members of the differs in that, in, in, in this very uh, respect, it differs from other international organizations. I have to say that uh, that, that um, uh, during this very special odd uh, ratification process, where in Finland and Sweden were objects during the past year, and Sweden still is, uh, the trust was not the word that came to Finnish mind. Uh, when 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 some members of the organization uh, plays fiddles and plays a very special game uh, uh, at the expense of the security. Uh, at, at the sec security interest of the two becoming members, the, 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 the trust was somewhat put into question uh, by my countrymen, and, and, and the Swedes are still putting it. Now the, my question to you is that uh, are uh, in this beautiful organization, are some members more trustworthy than others? And, and if this is true, uh, then uh, whom should we trust? If this is true, uh, whom does Norway trust? Um, uh, uh, an advice from, from, from a big brother to the kid brother would be very useful. Thank you, and then the gentleman in the first. Thank you very much. Senzaku is my name, I'm a Estonian ambassador here. We, um, uh, it's fascinating debate about the reassurance and deterrence and the use of a term uh, just to uh, complicate matters even further. I mean, it's now, you know, nine years from a time when reassurance was actually uh, talked in the context of reassuring uh, allies at the Eastern Front, uh, front and just kind of, you know, it's a good time to to come out clear and saying that we were uh, in Estonia at least really irritated uh, by that term used about that because it basically means it's not it's not that Russia needs to be deterred but those nervous wrecks at the eastern front line need to be reassured kind of you know that we are there so it's you know uh, so but this is a as a comment we uh, uh, it's, it's good that um, at least in, in NATO parlance, the, the deterrence is really back. The question is about the, um, all the different uh, regional uh, defense cooperation initiatives uh, or uh, programs. Uh, it's a kind of a whole alphabet uh, uh, soup of Jeff and NG, Northern Group and NordEFCO and NBH, Northern Nordic Baltic, uh, maybe somewhat I'm not remembering now. How does the, the both for for Finland and for Norway, uh, the um, the uh, Finnish membership in NATO and Swedish hopeful membership in NATO very soon change all that perspective in terms of uh, of, of regional defense cooperation frameworks. Thank you. Thank you and. Uh Let's try to have uh, relatively concise answers. Uh, maybe there is then still time for one question, but, but maybe we start with the ambassador and move the microphone towards Kristin. 
I'll, I'll try the one on uh, innate on, on trust first. My comment about trust was, was uh, directed towards Article 5 and when you are in the alliance. You know, the accession process, I think, is a very different thing. To, and it would be, to, in a way, to any international organization. I mean, or I remember our negotiations with the European Union. We were asked things to come up with uh, money and to, uh, to contribute to things and make concessions in certain sectors that uh, uh, many of my fellow countrymen would find t totally unacceptable, and that would be a mild ex expression. So I think the, once you're in the alliance, it's the, it's the trust that uh, in, in Article 5 and in the fact that actually in times of crisis there will be help is on the way. The accession process is a d and will with so many members will actually be a different exercise. And I think we saw that and we're still seeing it with, uh, uh, with, see uh, with Sweden. Once you're inside, Finland will make its own judgment. Then we all make our own own, uh, uh, own ju uh, judgments, and you will be part of a large sort of political culture that I'm sure uh, Finland will manage very very well. If I can say one thing on the on regional to my Estonian colleague, you know the the Jeff the Jeff was born before the uh, before the invasion of Ukraine before December 29 uh, uh, December 21 and the security guarantees. The, the Jeff was from a Norwegian perspective, the Joint Expeditionary Force, sorry for using this acronym. And it, for us, it was a brilliant instrument because of course we got Sweden and Finland. We got Sweden and Finland and the, the, the Brits and the Dutch and the Danes and, uh, and the Icelanders, they were, uh, they were there in the first place. That was, that, that was not the issue. There were all kinds of instruments for that. But for us, this was a super way of drawing in at military level, political level, and uh, uh, diplomatically, Sweden and Finland. Then they decided to join NATO, and you figured out that, hey, this, this actually worked quite well. It's a very, very flexible instrument. And to be very honest, I know I come straight from London for five years there, but it was a way of engaging the United Kingdom in issues in Northern Europe, in the Atlantic and the Baltic area. It was a way this is a this is an this is an institution in a way uh, led by led by the British, but in a very gentle way. You have to sometimes they are very good and they're good in 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 Jeff. They've been very good, and and uh, at almost all levels. So it's turned out to be one of those instruments that's been very very adaptable. But it came out of a very different concept before before the demand for the security guarantees in uh, December 21 and the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, just to, to comment quickly on the on the regional uh, aspect, um, and it's a, it's a good question, uh, but uh, I should say that uh, uh, having this, these different constellations of, of defense cooperation has been a deliberate policy for, for Finland for, for quite, quite some time. And I think that uh, they have proved extremely helpful uh, during, during the years, during the, the accession process, and, and of course also after, after the accession process. But, I mean, obviously they need to be also assessed uh, from time to time, and, and I'm sure they will be assessed in the, in the forthcoming uh, government report also, um, on the basis of, of, of our NATO accession, but also on the basis of, of the changing uh, security dynamics in, in Europe and beyond. Just very quickly on the question of the, the regional defense arrangements, which I think is very interesting. Uh, and also s a trend that we saw, we, because a, a few years ago we did a comparative study of the Nordic countries' security and defense changes. And we found that all the Nordic countries have a very similar way of sort of opting into the different types of arrangements that are available. Uh, and they are very happy sort of flexilateralists in that they uh, partake in different regional fora as well as the institutional frameworks. What has changed, as the ambassador was, was alluding to, is that NATO now has become the umbrella over all these arrangements. So whereas in the past there would be for us where you could join together members and non-members of NATO, they have now become structures that sort of fall in under the umbrella of NATO. Of course, Jeff was always intended that way. It was something that was sort of blessed by, by NATO in a sense. 
and from what I've seen uh, during the last five years, it has also developed more into a political forum for uh, consult uh, consulting and, and having dialogue with one another. But there's also additionally, of course, the Nordic Baltic uh, for us, which I think, uh, at least in the Norwegian uh, domestic discourse, are also high on the agenda and very often mentioned. So I think they're seen as sort of supplementary for it, depending on the issue at stake, and that might be something that we will see more of now that NATO is not only becoming bigger, but also with the uncertainty in, in the US domestic political climate. Okay, um, thank you for those uh, replies to the questions and uh, we are one minute ahead of, of ending this seminar. And this time I'm not gonna allow any more questions or comments since there's unfortunately an event starting pretty soon in this same uh, premise, so I have to uh, run by the book and, and uh, end this seminar. And uh, please join me in, in uh, giving applause once more to our speakers. Thank you so much. And thank you for attending this seminar, and I hope the discussion on, on Finland and Norway uh, continues. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.